Okay, welcome to our latest Downtown Den event, and I'm delighted this morning to be joined by Sir Howard Bernstein. Howard, of course, uh, instrumental in Manchester's regeneration over two decades, uh, headed the task force that uh, regenerated the city following the bombing in 1996, went on to put a successful bid together for a Manchester Commonwealth Games, was the architect of the Devo Mank deal, which was the first devolution deal uh, in England, and much more besides, of course. More recently, he now works as a consultant uh, for Deloitte and is working on a number of recovery plans, various cities uh, across the country, has worked internationally as well, and he's found time to pen a very interesting paper on how he thinks uh, the government may support businesses in the recovery phase. Howard, great to see you this morning. Thanks for joining Good morning. us. Morning, Frank. Uh, morning, and let, everyone. Uh, let me start with uh, that fabulous journey that you had during your time in Manchester. And um, one of the things that, of course, we're having to discover this moment in time is that uh, the R word, and not the R word and phrase the government refer to, but that R word, resilience. Uh, and Manchester has had buckets of it over the years, has had to deal with some uh, big knocks, but has nevertheless come through those difficult and challenging times. Uh, and of course, over that period, uh, it's become the indisputable capital of the Northern Powerhouse and much more besides. Just talk me through the start of that journey, Howard, when people came together and how early you had an ambition to make Manchester uh, the best city that it could possibly be because easy to forget back in the 80s um, you know it was I'll, I'll be kind and say it was struggling a bit yeah uh, that's certainly a very kind way of describing it um, I think it's been a journey um, I think um, when you look at uh, not just Manchester you look at the older industrial cities certainly in the UK at that time uh, what you saw, I think, were a series of places which had failed to come to terms with the impact of globalisation. Uh, so traditional industries, manufacturing, production, um, had actually been lost to the UK. That disproportionately impacted on places like Manchester. Um, and of course, what we were left with was a legacy of industrial dereliction. Uh, very, very narrow uh, economic uh, or industrial base, uh, high levels of poverty, uh, a reducing population, people who exercise choice or, or who could exercise choice chose to move out of the city. Um, and really all the essential characteristics of a, of a declining uh, city as well. And um, what we needed to do was, was to actually rethink well, what the role of cities uh, should be actually how do you repopulate them how do you create neighborhoods where people want to live rather than uh, have to live because they've got no choice how do you actually create that essential diversified economic and business space in order to support long-term growth and that's really the journey that not just manchester but uh, many of our cities in this country have been on for the last 20 30 years uh, and and now um, we are, uh, certainly in Manchester's case, a much more diversified uh, city uh, and um, one of the, you know, if there is any uh, potential advantage as a result of this crisis, um, you know, we have got the uh, diversity in that business base in order to be able uh, to get through this uh, latest global challenge. I think there's two things Manchester did, though, Howard, under the leadership of yourself and Sir Richard Least, that many other cities took a time to actually get to grips with. First was those very strong <coughs> private-public sector partnerships that you built. And you very quickly, and I think long before many others, came to the conclusion that without private sector support and without a proposal that enabled the private sector to come in and support what you were trying to do, it wouldn't happen, certainly wouldn't happen as quickly. And then, of course, the other thing and the blueprint that many others look to now in terms of collaboration 
across the city region was that way in which you were able to work alongside uh, other local authorities in Greater Manchester, bring that lot together and you know, take the very diverse asks that each of those towns and, and other cities in fact have, uh, but bring them together to speak as one voice. Uh, and that was quite unique and quite innovative. And as I say, you did it in Manchester uh, a fair few years before other people were able to get a grip of that. Um, I think, to be fair, there was a lot to build on. Um, the, the abolition of uh, the Greater Manchester County Council, for those people who can remember that, um, in the mid-80s, um, beyond, uh, which was broadly welcomed by almost everyone uh, in Greater Manchester at the time, um, was, was quite a watershed, I think, in, in, in individual local authorities in Greater Manchester, recognising the need to continue to work together. There were, you know, in, well, two or three things. One was Greater Manchester was a distinct economic geography. Uh, we all know, don't we, that the way people work, the way people travel, the way businesses make decisions about where they should locate, they don't really respect administrative boundaries. Uh, the labour market in Greater Manchester uh, is a single uh, labour market by and large. So how you actually create a productive uh, economy in Greater Manchester is a function of how all of us should uh, need to work together, define our key strengths, uh, work through uh, how those key strengths were going to create significant jobs, how we were all going to work together to create a transport system which enabled people to access those jobs, um, create neighbourhoods where people chose to live, um, rebuild our economic base, uh, look at our key assets like our universities, uh, like Manchester Airport. Um, so there was a lot of joint work undertaken in the 80s and 90s about how we created that focus and at the same time is recognising that the essential role of the private sector was to create wealth. Um, and unless you're creating wealth, we haven't got anything to redistribute. So fundamentally, the private sector had a pivotal role um, in working with us within our agreed framework about what sorts of jobs uh, could be created, what sorts of investment opportunities uh, needed to be generated, what sorts of sectors should we be working together in order to drive long-term sustainable growth? So investment in our science base, in our cultural base, uh, on our technological base, uh, has been a fundamental part of creating not just a vibrant uh, economy, but also a diversified business space, which as I've said, is absolutely fundamental to be able to um, uh, create that essential resilience to cope with cyclical shocks of the type we're experiencing now. Mm. Uh, and that is something that, <laughs> as a city council, Manchester was never shy about creating wealth, about being entrepreneurial, about taking some risks. Uh, that's not necessarily um, attributes that you would attach to a Labour council. And so I think that when you say it almost, well, it, it was inevitable that it happened because, you know, the county council had gone and of course you've got to have the private sector involved in creating wealth. Well, it may have been obvious to you, mate, <laughs> yeah. but it wasn't, it wasn't necessarily <laughs> happening elsewhere. And I think that's why, um, if I can put it this way, Manchester had a head start on many of the other cities who followed in your wake in a sense but the other thing i always thought manchester was great at and continues to be actually is picking winners both in terms of those private sector companies that you worked with as key stakeholders but more importantly where the next growth sectors were going to come from so you were investing quite heavily in science and tech again quite a bit before others how do those sort of decisions come about? Is it a collective sort of think tank of people who come together? Is it just keeping an eye on the markets? Or is it, you know, those collaborations that you have with the business sector that helps you come to those conclusions? 
I think it's all of those things, Frank. Um, I think, you know, I, I never saw myself uh, as just the chief executive of the city uh, council. I always saw myself as the chief executive of a place. I think Richard and before him, Graham, saw, saw themselves as leaders of Manchester, not just the council. So that essential place leadership role is absolutely pivotal for competent local government uh, discharging uh, their responsibilities for creating places where people want to live, work and invest. Um, so it's never just been an organisational uh, thing. Of course, we want the council to be efficient. We want the council to be a vibrant part of the uh, solution. Um, but unless you are outward facing, unless you are creating those collaborations, those partnerships, you understand what's going on in the market, you expose yourself to that external challenge at critical stages in the journey. Um, you know, we did um, embrace challenge. You know, the Manchester Independent Economic Review was a very good example of, of how uh, collectively leadership in Greater Manchester said, look, we think we're doing okay here, but let's just see whether or not uh, our policies, our practices, our priorities are actually relevant for the next 10 years. Let's bring in some people who are going to challenge us, um, as well as our business community as well. Uh, and what happened was, you know, well, you are doing okay, but you can still do so much better, which of course gave us the impetus to institutionalise our uh, governance arrangements in Greater Manchester. It led to the creation of the statutory authority of the combined authority it also led us down the road in marrying up far more the growth agenda with our public services uh, reform agenda and ultimately led to the devolution deal which has resulted um, in the creation of the structure which is now led by andy uh, so effectively at the present time i was talking to richard lease a few weeks ago uh, on a call similar to this and he was talking about significant milestones in that journey that you described and he said that actually the Commonwealth Games they're obviously fantastic and the city did a great job in terms of delivering super fortnight of events um, prior to that there was an Olympic bid <coughs> and he was he was reflecting on the fact that initially you know Manchester got laughed out of court for putting that bid together uh, but actually, it put you in a mindset that was on the same stage as Barcelona's and other big, major European cities. And it, he, he was suggesting that that was a major turning point for the city. I think he's right. Um, it, it, not just in terms of demonstrating our ability to be competitive internationally, but also in underpinning the breadth and strength of the partnerships that existed within the city um, you know it, it wasn't just our rhetoric um, which was talking about Manchester being potential Olympic big city it was also business leaders uh, who were talking uh, in those terms as well the impetus which that Olympic bid gave us to creating uh, a very clear strategic vision about how sport and culture could become even further embedded in our wider regeneration plans for Manchester. You know, it was on the back of the Olympic bid that the whole sport and culture thing, particularly in East Manchester, uh, and we can see the evidence of, of how that's worked. And there's still much to do, of course, but nonetheless, the creation of, of uh, what was then Sports City, which is now the Etihad campus, the way in which uh, that wider, uh, uh, platform has been created to to drive significant changes but you know places never stand still places you can never look back you you've always got to look forward um, and uh, those places that don't look forward end up walking backwards uh, and that's always been uh, I think and still remains very much part of the DNA in Manchester which is um, you're always as good as your last failure so yeah. 
uh, moving forward, taking people with you, being clear about your priorities, reflecting changes in societal priorities as well. And I think that's a, a big, big issue, uh, not just for Manchester, but for many places in the UK now. Uh, you know, people's views about each other, people's views about what's important have changed because of this crisis, I think. Uh, and we have to uh, reflect that uh, in the way in which we move forward and also continue to challenge um, the, the sense of this continued dominance of the Westminster model. Um, you know, those people who work with me and know me uh, I've known that I've long been an advocate for fundamental change in the way in which we govern ourselves in this country. And if the crisis has told us anything, is that the over-dominance of the Westminster top-down, over-centralised model actually doesn't work very effectively. Um, and, and therefore, we've got to continue to challenge and refine that in order to ensure local places have got greater authority, greater power, to take more control over their own destiny. As I mentioned in my <coughs> open remarks, Howard, you were a key architect in the initial devolution deal for Manchester, the first in England. And of course, George Osborne uh, was a key component in terms of driving forward that Northern powerhouse agenda. Uh, I remember at the time there was some controversy about bringing health and care into that yeah. package. Well, again, people are looking at that now and seeing the sense of, yeah. of actually having a regional approach. Uh, and in fact, although I know the United States is getting a, a, a huge amount of stick for all sorts of things at the moment, rightly so, um, it, the, the impression that you get when you listen to informed commentators there is that actually a lot of the states have managed the virus well because they do have those devolved powers. So actually, it would have been much worse if it would have been a top-down approach, which basically was laissez-faire. Yeah. And I think in Manchester, again, <laughs> by having control of health and care, they've been able to co coordinate things perhaps better than, than in other places which don't have that opportunity. That must be right, uh, undoubtedly right. Um, I think if you look at um, what's been delivered in Greater Manchester over the past weeks, uh, particularly around how they've joined up um, uh, services, how they've addressed the all-important requirement about how you manage data uh, and align uh, systems around public services, around health, social care. You know, that's, that's always been, in, in my view, a fundamental problem with the over-centralised system. Uh, and if anything, that has to create a platform for further embedding those changes uh, in the future, not just to cope with, you know, huge shocks associated with the crisis of this global scale, uh, but also to continue to support people in the future, early help, early intervention, which is ultimately, as we've known for a very long time, you know, population health is one of the key influences on a productive labor market. Um, and, you know, the more we uh, reform our public services, the more we actually drive uh, the sorts of changes which are required, the more prosperous uh, we'll be and the stronger our economy will be in the future. And outside of that health and care agenda, Howard, what are the other areas that you think devolution and a greater devolved system of power uh, should be Target at that uh, because well, of yeah well yeah. the presumption should be everything to be perfectly honest with you yeah. given the quality and effectiveness of governments not <laughs> just this government governments generally um, you know transport uh, is 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 clearly uh, an obvious uh, area how we uh, manage uh, skills that is going to become increasingly uh, important. You know, when the furlough scheme actually gets unwound, it's quite clear that we're going to be left with a, a significantly increased pool of unemployed people. Um, that's nobody's fault, to be fair, but how we tackle that problem, it cannot be a, a, a central solution. Um, you know, um, we have got to 
have um, put, put in the hands of democratically accountable leaders um, the responsibility for equipping people with the skills that are needed for the jobs we are going to be creating uh, in the future. Uh, there's always been a skills deficit in many of our cities and uh, parts of the UK. That skills deficit will become even wider, I would suggest, over the next couple of years, unless we really do rethink how key services such as that are commissioned, targeted around real people, uh, and executed in order to ensure people are equipped with the skills they need to be able to access the jobs that are going to be created over the next few years. And if you go beyond that school skills, education, train agenda, Howard, you've mentioned transport as well. Of course, there was a lot of talk before the crisis of a levelling up agenda for, from central government, which seemed to be aimed at infrastructure spend. Uh, and a project that I know is one being close to your heart, which is HS2, but also Northern Powerhouse Rail. Uh, any sense from you that the government may be looking at its finances now and thinking, well, that's a step too far. We might try and do something a bit more piecemeal. Well, they could well do that. They would be wrong, of course, to, to do that. Um, you know, but let's be clear, Northern Powerhouse Rail, Hester, they're not quick fixes, are they? Uh, and a commitment uh, which is now being given, I think, for the third time that we're going to go ahead with these schemes will not see any material changes for, for several years. Um, so the levelling up agenda is not just about infrastructure investment, although that's an important part of the medium long term plan. It has to be linked to skills, it has to be linked to education, it has to be linked to all of those key influences on industrial policy, demand and supply, in order to ensure that those key sectors in the north of England, which Manchester thankfully uh, has significant global strengths in, are actually developed and nurtured and, brought, and ensure that they can achieve their full potential. So. So the levelling up agenda is not just about infrastructure, it has to be a comprehensive approach to demand and supply uh, where the economy is concerned. And I think we have to look for evidence over the coming months that that will continue to impact on, on government policy. When I was listening to the narrative around levelling up, uh, and some of the debates and discussions that were taking place during the last election. It seemed to me that many towns across the country were saying that they'd been ignored, that they felt left out. Now, of course, we had a situation uh, through the 80s, actually, uh, where cities were almost abandoned. We've seen lots of out-of-city developments. We've seen uh, this idea uh, come th forward through Mrs Thatcher's government, uh, that actually cities were the past and, you know, it was towns and uh, developments of commercial space outside of cities that were the future. Uh, and I just sensed, Howard, that there was a move towards a situation which we've seen in the past, in the not too distant past, actually, where it wasn't a case of prioritising where you were going to get a better bang for your buck, but you were going to prioritise where you thought you needed to keep votes and that's always a dangerous proposition um, because I remember again a conversation that you and I have had in the past where you said that it was the bomb that actually made Greater Manchester understand how important the city was. The question I suppose I'm going to ask is, is there a danger that under the relatively new administration we have now we'll start to see a move away from support in cities in the way that we have over the last 20 years or so, back towards that let's level everything up or let's level everything down. Yeah, that, that I'm sure is a, a risk it, um, we, and we've got to guard against that. Uh, it's never been a question of cities versus towns. Um, it's both of them, uh, actually. Uh, and you know, when, when we talk about uh, an industrial policy, when we talk about skills, when we talk about an economic geography, it's about how all parts of that 
economic geography can be encouraged to achieve its full economic potential. And, and part of the problem for me, um, I can say this now at some at one level, um, is that places, and I'm not referring at all to uh, Greater Manchester in, in this, but I see it more and more now since um, I departed from the public sector. You see different places not portraying the same leadership, the same quality of leadership um, as, as what you would normally find um, in Greater Manchester. Uh, certainly in Manchester, when I was there, um, talking politically rather than executive, uh, and other parts of Greater Manchester. So um, at the end of the day, whether you're a smaller town, whether or not you're a smaller city, you, you've still got your shape, uh, your place shaping responsibilities to discharge, um, because not everything can come from government. Uh, if if a town in 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 anywhere in the UK um, want need to have a vision about its future, um, and unless that vision and that strategy is developed in that place, it's not going to happen. Uh, and you know how those towns and and those as well as cities uh, adapt to changes in the way in which the commercial market, industrial policy generally has changed, unless they adapt their policies to reflect those uh, changes, then they're going to be left further and further uh, behind. Um, so all places have got assets. Young people want to live in town centres. Uh, they want the ability to access uh, spaces for incubating businesses. They want workspace uh, opportunities, um, uh, how you actually rejuvenate older town centres, uh, which is not dominated by a model such as retail, which we've known for some years is actually changing. The demand for retail is changing, is important. How you actually introduce more leisure, destination uses in town centres. What does that mean for public services? Those are all challenges, which frankly, we're there before this current crisis and beyond this crisis in my view those challenges will become even bigger because what the crisis has done i think is has accelerated the changes which we already saw in some of those key sectors particularly retail um, and which have got to be reflected in the way in which different places actually renew their their plans for for change before I move on, Howard, to this fascinating paper you've written with <coughs> Jim O'Neill in terms of your thoughts about how we can support business to recover it, I just want to take you back to that Northern Powerhouse piece. We spoke a lot about Greater Manchester, uh, but again, I know that when you and George, Richard and others were putting the initial Devo Mank deal together, it was very much in your mind that you know, Leeds in particular uh, was on the agenda then for a devolution deal. They've only just achieved that. I mean, that, that was only announced in March. Uh, and then the Northern Powerhouse brand seems to me has taken a bit of a knock and almost has become tied entirely to transport projects. Uh, but if we are going to rebalance the economy, it can't just be Greater Manchester, can it? We do oh, need no. other great no, northern cities to play its role. I, I wonder if you have any sense of the northern powerhouse the north being able to come together a bit better a bit more collaboratively uh, and uh, you know i've got an emotional attachment to lancashire you know how do places like lancashire play their part in as i say this rebalancing of uk plc that was talked about by osborne and co but doesn't really seem to be part of the current administration's narrative well I think the jury's still out about the current uh, administration narrative. Uh, I think that what you've said about the downgrading of the Northern Powerhouse strategy certainly applied uh, under the previous government, um, where uh, for a whole range of reasons, uh, the levelling up agenda became almost the lowest common denominator uh, 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 agenda. And that was um, a retrograde step. Uh, not just in my view, but in the view of many uh, people. Um, what we 
what we had from the current Prime Minister <coughs> very early on was a commitment to the Northern Powerhouse. We, we've got a um, pretty active Secretary of State, um, uh, Secretary of State also for Transport, um, who has uh, is now been given the responsibility uh, for the Northern Powerhouse, which in principle is, is very much to be welcomed. And I think what we've now got to do is look for the evidence over the next few months about how far the Northern Powerhouse, both as a strategy, is influencing uh, mainstream um, uh, policies, particularly national economic re recovery policies beyond um, this current crisis. Uh, and, you know, it can't just be about transport. Uh, it's got to be around how those key uh, industrial sectors which which are globally distinctive um, you mentioned Lancashire Lancashire have got some key economic strengths particularly around aerospace particularly around energy um, which if they were harnessed properly uh, as well as the wider uh, strengths of the north of England around life sciences around advanced manufacturing um, to name us a few can become the engine of of economic growth for many, many years. So, so it, it is not just a transport plan, it's how we produce an integrated uh, strategy which marries people with jobs, jobs with key industrial sectors, and where we have a fully functioning system which is supporting uh, people and supporting investment in those sectors uh, in the future. And then, of course, what places like Lancashire, like Greater Manchester, Merseyside, elsewhere have to do is, 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 is organise themselves, if I'm being <laughs> really frank, Frank, uh, uh, is, is to actually recognise, you know, how do we actually work together in order to meet the challenges ahead? Um, what should we be asking of government in terms of the support we need to ensure our economy recovers. They've got some clear uh, challenges in Lancashire with rural as well as urban uh, tourism, uh, which is gonna be a challenge over the next couple of months. But what is the essential support we need? And what do we do for ourselves by working together in creating that essential leadership in driving some of our distinctive uh, sectors of growth. Uh, and, you know, no different in Lancashire than the challenges in Greater Manchester or Merseyside or in other parts of the north of England. You take Teesside as a, another example where uh, under Ben and the local authority leaders uh, up there, you know, they've come together and created a very cohesive and coherent plan for moving their sub-region forward and the difference today compared what it was four or five years ago is remarkable <coughs> so you can do it yeah 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 and it is about <coughs> collaborating and getting the right people in the room and as you absolutely, say absolutely leadership is leadership leadership. yeah yeah howard you mentioned earlier that you never look to the past you never <coughs> talk about the successes uh, you're always looking at the next thing that has to be done so it was no surprise when popping into my inbox came a paper from yourself and Jim O'Neill about looking to the recovery, looking ahead uh, to suggest some ideas as to how businesses could be supported by government. So talk us through that paper, which I, I think is fascinating and certainly something that if they're not considering, government certainly should be considering. Well, we understand that they are considering uh, this stuff. Um, I think you, you've got to look at this crisis in sort of three different phases. Uh, phase one is really about how do you protect as much as you can? How do you protect uh, people in the labour market? How do you protect um, businesses? Um, so all that stuff around loans and furloughing uh, of staff. Um, we can have a view about whether that's been absolutely perfect, but the, the overall emphasis around the strategy on phase one is protect. 
I think we're now coming towards the end of phase one and we're starting to move into what I would describe phase two being the refunctionality phase. You know, how do we get back up um, uh, and all our, as many cylinders in the engine firing as, as quickly as we can? And that's going to be a, a long haul, I think, leading to phase three, the final phase, which is how do you rebuild? Uh, and as people like Andy are saying, how do you rebuild even better than what we had before? And when you start looking about what should be the essential fiscal instruments to drive uh, change, um, I think, for me, you, you address, well, what do businesses need? Uh, um, what they don't need, it seems to me, uh, providing they are inherently viable, is loads, you know, a huge amount of additional debt being being uh, give, pushed on them. Um, so more debt means uh, less uh, cash flow. Uh, you know, I think it doesn't actually get businesses to operate uh, effectively. Uh, and therefore, you, you need to start to look at, well, how do we recapitalize uh, businesses? Uh, and by doing so, uh, actually enable the state to take a, a share in, in the upside. So the more businesses that are successful, the more the state's um, uh, interest in those companies uh, can actually flourish. Uh, and businesses will have the opportunity to to get rid of the debt or the state investment within a within a specified uh, period of time. So that was the idea. Um, and at the same time, you start to think, well, how can uh, that sort of platform also promote change? So in return for that investment, we want businesses, as an example, to do more on employment and training. We want businesses to adapt their models uh, to support a zero carbon uh, economy. We want to promote better diversity employment uh, policies. Uh, important so societal priorities, I would suggest, as a result of this crisis. <coughs> so the overall um, uh, strategy, therefore, is, is to actually create this big national platform which is administered at a regional level into to support that, that those changes. Uh, and then having come up with that idea, you then did a bit more research and worked out, well, actually, uh, this was done just after the Second World War, uh, when uh, the Bank of England with other banks had actually said, well, we need to actually modernise and diversify our, our industrial base. We'll set up a big fund which did exactly that. And it's interesting as well, in America, they did something similar. Uh, you know, some would argue it's part and parcel of what the Marshall Plan uh, were, were, was about. And of course, in the last big crash, uh, when Gordon Brown actually bailed out the banks, he never just handed them money. He actually uh, created equity in those banks uh, by recapitalizing them in order to be able to get the banks to refunction. Uh, again, and, and I think there are some important lessons to be learned from history uh, in the way in which we develop new platforms of fiscal management uh, going going forward. So that was the essence of the idea. What it isn't is a bailout fund. So, that, and we all know who those companies are. They were struggling before the crisis. Um, you know, uh, so it wouldn't be. Um, a fund where, where companies which uh, are not able to adapt their business models to current challenges, where they are inherently uh, unviable, or businesses who want support in order to continue to give shareholders returns, uh, which are disproportionate to what they're earning or the success of companies. It wouldn't be that type of platform. And indeed, in order to ensure those decisions were not taken, um, we, we think, Jim and I, that what is, would be required 
is, is yes, it would be a government owned platform, but it, the actual decisions will be taken by, you know, independent people, uh, which avoided therefore the interference of, of, of ministers who for a variety of reasons, we all know why, would be encouraged by this vested group or that vested group to make decisions. This would have to be uh, proper stewardship of public money uh, and robust decision making based on evidence. Would there be a role for devolved governments in that, Howard? Of course be, yeah, they could. Um, but my argument as well is, you know, we are probably talking here about a fund that needs tens of billions of pounds yeah 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 so as much as i'm a, a a champion of greater manchester i don't think we'd be able to access tens of billions of pounds to yeah. administer um so i think you've therefore got to look at you know how do you create the biggest national platform uh you've got to you've got to administer that fund throughout the country and there would be mature organizations and structures uh, already uh, in existence to be able to help them do that. Greater Manchester would be one, Merseyside, West Yorkshire, South, Devon, all of that would, would, yeah. would happen. And therefore, by creating that, that scaled platform, the opportunity would then be for individual places to work out, well, how do we get more than our fair share of that resource? Okay. And that's how, how it should be. Local authorities working with local businesses, helping them fill in the applications forms, aligning those business priorities with their own policies uh, and actually supporting that overall recapitalization process, which I think is going to be essential mm -hmm. to underpin long-term sustainable change. Mm. I understand the Chancellor's going to held an emergency budget uh, over the summer uh, that potentially then could be something that he brings forward uh, and I, I think I don't want to get into the government's management of, of the crisis there's enough people discuss that elsewhere but I think Rishi Sunak overall has, has done a good job that's my impression don't know what your view is Howard I think I, I... I think it's, um, that's right. You know, I think uh, by and large, he's brought forward the right sort of policies. Um, but, you know, the big test, of course, uh, is, is how we move into the next phase. Uh, and, and, and in moving into that next phase, how we're actually creating pathways to the long-term future uh, of our economy. Uh, and that's why you know, radical, ambitious plans such as the ones we've just been talking about are, are going to be important. What I've suggested is not the only way in which you can do that. Uh, there are variants of that sort of model. But unless we have, in my view, some mechanism for recapitalizing uh, businesses and for also for encouraging new startup businesses, which, you know, every, every, every history lesson about recessions always show that in the aftermath of these shocks there is a, a surge in um you know starts of businesses uh, and how we actually harness that creative uh, opportunity is i think also going to be a very important challenge for the government uh, that it needs to respond to final question from me before i go to our panel who've been typing away their questions for you uh we've gone Three quarters of an hour without mentioning the B word. Uh, but it's still hovering in the background. In fact, it's looming large now because the next round of negotiations on Brexit are coming forward. Um, I get, look, we all thought at the start of this year that was going to be the big economic challenge for the government, getting us through those talks. I know that you're a, a great observer of what happens across the globe and certainly what's happening in Europe. Um, so, are we in a stronger position now, ironically, because of the hit that Europe has taken in terms of those negotiations, or perhaps weaker? What do you think? I'm not sure, really, um, I, I, and that's the honest uh, answer. Um, I, I'm pretty clear walking out, uh, in, I don't think government's going to extend the transitional period. Um, I think that much is is pretty clear, and I sort of understand that, really, because 
um, you know, I think it, it says it wants a deal. It's got to bring a deal back. Uh, and if it, there is a deal that's brought back, which is we sensible, um, then we, we're going to have to get on with this. Um, what I think we've got to avoid inevitably, uh, particularly on the back of this crisis, is is where we we just effectively walk away, and 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 rely on the WTO agreement because I can't believe that's going to be remotely helpful to our economic recovery. Quite frankly, and and I'm pretty convinced the government recognised that as well. Right, let's get to the questions from uh, our <coughs> this morning. So, um, got a couple here from Alexander Rose from DWF. Um, so, how do you think forthcoming public funded programmes such as the UK Shared Prosperity Fund can best be designed to enable and all to catch up with the South East? Uh, and um, follow up question, a complimentary question, I suppose, to that from uh, Alexander is, uh, you've been incredibly successful at securing funding from central government. What are your tips for organisations in the north seeking to achieve the same? Well, uh, I think when we talk about the the UK Prosperity Fund, I think everyone's still waiting with with bated breath, really, for the guidance. Uh, um, my, my sense is it, it needs to be focused around you know, those sectors that are going to drive economic growth in the long term. Um, so it, it needs to be around, um, you know, those key sectors, whether it's creative, whether it's digital, whether it's scientific, innovation based, all those key sectors, um, which we all know is the key to long term uh, change. Um, there's another point as well for me here, I think, and, and it, it's a distinction between what I talked about around that shared equity fund. I, I don't w want to see the prosperity fund or wouldn't want to see it actually used to help businesses tra transition to the brave new world. Uh, that should be the role of the other fund which, which I'm talking about. Um, because too often we've seen, haven't we, a whole range of programmes over the years where instead of focusing on new sectors of growth and equipping ourselves uh, with the skills, with the assets which are needed to drive long-term change, we actually see objectives being distorted by those programmes where, where uh, older uh, industries or older sectors are being given resources from that fund in order to transition, and they never can, uh, because they're not being given the proper incentives to uh, transition. Uh, so I think it is being clear about, about priorities and being really, really focused around those long-term sectors of change linked to uh, the sort of zero carbon, carbon uh, economy with all of us aspire to and which we need to make dramatic progress on over the next decade or, or more and alongside that there is uh, and again it goes back to the point which your other question was raising about well how do you actually improve your chances of accessing national resources uh, and I think that's by being clear and bold and ambitious about what sort of place you're trying to create uh, and and that is a function of how well you're joining up with all your policies, how you're actually marrying those policies with what we think represents national uh, priorities. Uh, and there, of course, then we've got to look at fiscal devolution uh, as well as part of that overall mix. So this shouldn't just be about how we, create, how we access new money. This should also be about how we actually articulate a coherent case for spending existing uh, national taxation uh, policies, such as car taxation, uh, uh, more intelligently by devolving responsibilities to economic geographers who want to discharge those, those priorities. 
when you and I have spoken in the past, the uh, government ministers uh, have had similar conversations in terms of Manchester's success. One of the things that you were always great at in Manchester was putting evidence-based cases together so that you could go to governments and say, if you invest X, the return will be Y. And again, I think a lot of people have got their heads around that now and creating those same sort of plans, that same sort of approach. But the other thing I've discovered over the past 12 months, when you talk to those same ministers or people within the corridors of power at Whitehall, is that the other thing they're looking for is trusted partners. Yeah. And Manchester was always seen as a place where you could put your money and you would deliver. And we do need, in other parts of the country, without mentioning names, to get some, as you say, leadership and credibility into those places if the government are going to be confident of handing that cash over because it's going to be limited, Howard. So you are going to want, as a government, to put your cash where you know you're going to get a bigger bang for your buck. No, that's absolutely right. And it goes back again to the leadership yeah. uh, question, not just everywhere. Um, and, you know, let's be clear, some of the stuff that we're talking about, it, it's very hard. <laughs> you know, it's not easy. Uh, you know, taking health, social care on was probably uh, the right thing to do. Um, but it was, it's was it been a lot of very, very heavy, heavy lifting, both when I was doing what I did and, and people who've done it since I've left. Um, so, you know, this is not straightforward stuff. Um, but you know, my argument's very clear. If you want to tackle air quality, you actually want to tackle uh, behaviour uh, around how we change, uh, move people away from cars and move people more into public transport. We want to ensure the most efficient utilisation of our wider uh, transport system. Then we've got to exercise all the all the levers of, of power. Uh, and if that remains as fragmented as it does now between local government and central government, as well as all these rather strange uh, franchising arrangements that exist um, um, around the system, then we are not going to be able to make the intelligent choices uh, around policy and prioritise resources individual places need to make. Um, so we have to tackle some of those issues head on. Um, just building on those challenges, a uh, question uh, here from, uh, let me just get the name right, Gareth Evans from Into. Uh, given the further rise in online shop and demand habits as a result of COVID-19 restrictions and requirements, what are Sir Howard's views on the future viability of and new opportunities for retail sector both in terms of the local high street and the traditional shopping centre. I know you've, you've done some thinking around this, Howard, so you will have views on this. Um, I think it's a struggle, <laughs> really. Um, so increasingly, we have to look at, uh, at, at retail as part of that wider destination uh, offer. Um, you know, and, you know, so for me, when we look at retail as being single, one-dimensional uh, offers, um, we have to rethink about what we mean by creating that wider uh, destination offer. So what is the role of leisure as part of those centres? How do we actually change the way in which some of those centres operate? Uh, particularly, can some of these uh, centres be used to support workspace? Uh, can they be used to create different opportunities for young people to live and work uh, in those centres, which actually start to change the dynamics of, of what that wider immunity uh, provision needs to be. Um, um, you know, I'm not as, um, uh, as pessimistic as, as some commentators about the long-term future of retail uh, or shopping centres, um, but I do think they face and have faced uh, big challenges. Uh, so they have to change their models in order to underpin their prospects of survival, in my opinion. Uh, and not everywhere is the same, uh, but there are, I think, real opportunities for shopping centres to really think about how it 
they diversify their destination role. Thank you. Uh, final question from our panellists, I think, or a couple more actually, sorry. Um, so, Lisa Morton, a uh, good friend from Roland Dransfield, who uh, uh, you know well, Howard, she's asking, uh, she's, she says, you've been instrumental in building this city and rebuilding it many times. What do you think, Manchester, why do you think Manchester is so resilient in, in adversity? There's something uh, in the city's DNA, do you think, Howard? I think there is, and the fact that we've had so much adversity to be resilient about uh, is probably part of the uh, answer uh, to that, really. So when you fail, keep trying. Um, I think, you know, at the end of the day, cities are, by their nature, resilient, uh, I think. Um, even in the dark days, you know, Manchester uh, never lost, it lost its swagger and its its sense of place i think it you know many of the challenges which which the cities faced at that time uh was you know how do you grapple with this new phenomenon called globalization and at one level we're still fighting some of those challenges uh, as a nation uh today um so so it's been it's about in my view being ahead of the curve by anticipating not everything you know no one anticipated a pandemic uh um but it's about understanding what the impacts of that pandemic uh will have uh, on the economy of the area uh and for the most part what it will do is accelerate the demise or the changes which i think you could uh, evidence before this crisis actually took place so it's not just about therefore putting back what we've lost and of course we need to ensure that we put back as much of it as we can but it's also about ensuring that what we're creating for the future is sustainable for the future as well this is the final question from our uh, audience today uh, it's from Stephen Young Lancashire County Council. Uh, what one thing would Howard want to change if he had his career over again? Interesting. I've never asked you that, so that's a great question. And the follow-up is, what does he see as the next big thing GM needs to crack? Um, um, I think uh, I, I, I do regret the, um, the, um, the road pricing, the congestion charge. Uh, debate. I think that was divisive uh, and we should have just got on with it and done it uh, <laughs> quite <laughs> frankly uh, because well you know I just find it happened you know, now anyway isn't it somehow well uh, well yeah but that uh, you know and and at the end of the day I think we would have been in a, a much stronger uh, position uh, for having done it but but that was a, a political failure in, in many respects um, but it goes back to the heart of the point I'm, I was talking earlier. If, if you want to change behaviours, we have got to get the right financial incentives in play for the entire system to ensure people exercise choice to use the right transport at the right times of the day. So uh, there's nothing wrong with the logic. It's probably the execution that left uh, a little bit to be desired. Um, so I think that's important. I think what I still think that sort of stuff is is part of the big challenge for places, uh, but it's hard, you know. It, it, it's not easy. Um, but rebuilding cities is not easy, you know. Rebuilding um, the sorts of coalitions that are required to rebuild uh, cities and drive economic growth is not easy. Uh, and you know, looking at health, social care, and the strides that have been made in Greater Manchester, which have been extremely strong, uh, there is now an even bigger platform to actually move to a truly integrated health and uh, social care system, um, which not only got community services at the heart, so that not everyone has to go in hospital, uh, but also creates the platform for wider public sector reform in the way in which data and commissioning arrangements for services are actually discharged. I think, 
you know, the next three, four, five years can give Greater Manchester unparalleled opportunities in those sorts of areas, uh, and which I think will stand it in great stead for long-term economic growth. Howard, as always, great to see you, mate. It's, uh, Thank you. It's been too long. I can't wait to uh, get together and have a, a coffee or something a bit stronger. Okay, mate. Okay. Of course. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> All the best to everybody. Thanks very much, Howard. I'll All see the you. All the best. Cheers, mate. Thank you. Thank Dad. you. Bye. Bye.